Okay, everyone, welcome. Um, to uh, welcome to this uh, American Constitution Society, Chicago Lawyer Chapter, ACLU of Illinois, Supreme Court term, review and preview. Um, this is at, at least, I think, I, I forgot to check the 15th year, at least this program has begun. Uh, uh, for many years, uh, we were at Mayor Brown, that was not possible this year, at least. Uh, still because of their pandemic restrictions, we hope to return this. Veteran, you veterans of this program may remember it, it uh, typically took place in the summer as a review of the past term this year. For various reasons, we decided to hold it now. Well, today, first Monday in October, the court convenes and make it more of a preview of the current term, uh, the, 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 the term about to begin, but with some looking back as well. So um, my name is Steve Sanders. I became affiliated with this program back when I was an associate at Mayor Brown. I now teach at the Indiana University Mauer School of Law in Bloomington, but they're uh, kind enough to have me back. And I'm originally from Chicago, so always happy to be here. Um, let me tell you briefly our format. Uh, we have five panelists. Each of them will speak for no more than 10 minutes. They will each speak about one uh, major case, either from the previous term or the upcoming term. Two of them will take on a secondary case as well. So in, in total, you'll hear about seven uh, key cases, six of them, I think, uh, coming up in the coming term. Um, they will bring their expertise and their perspectives to uh, telling us about those cases, what to look for, why they're important to uh, an audience of legal progressives, as I take it most of this audience is. Um, after that, we hope to have some time for just a little general discussion among the panelists. I'm eager to get their views about the current court, um, uh, its legitimacy. That term has been in the news lately as some of the justices have been giving their thoughts about it. I'm curious to hear our panel's thoughts. And then finally, we'll have uh, time for some Q&A and we will um, end at about 1.30. Um, there is CLE available during the midpoint of the program for CLE rules. I'm not allowed to do it until then. The midpoint of the program, I will announce and give to the folks uh, online as well the, the magic word that you need to enter uh, to get your CLE credit. Um, if you have any CLE questions, please ask one of the organizers from the ACLU or ACS. Um, finally, before I introduce the panelists, let me just thank everyone who was responsible for making this year's event happen. From the ACLU of Illinois, uh, Kayla Flanagan, Emily Scott, Luis Gomez, and Mary Thomas, uh, grateful for their help in organizing and, and rounding up, herding all the cats and getting the AV and, and monitoring the AV. From um, the American Constitution Society, Megan Paulus, Dan Cotter, Rebecca Sundin, Peggy Lee, and Jerry Brown from the uh, Chicago Lawyer Chapter or from the National ACLU, uh, ACS staff. I don't know if Kelly is here from uh, Kent Law. Kelly Change uh, has been our contact here at Kent. We're grateful to Chicago Kent Law School for making this very nice facility available to us. Uh, and also Mayor Brown has for many years been essential to putting this program on and supporting it. So we're thankful for their continued interest and support as well. Um, we have, uh, when last I checked, over 130 people online joining us uh, uh, through hybrid, through Zoom, as well as the people here in the audience. And so uh, uh, the speakers will remember that. And, and, and uh, we will again mention the CLE code sometime during the midpoint of the semester. Let me introduce the panelists now in the order in which uh, they will speak. Um, Colleen Connell uh, is the executive director of the ACLU of Illinois, has been a part of this program really from the very start, I think has been our longest serving uh, panelist as part of this uh, annual program, other, other than me. Um, um, Ami Gandhi is a senior counsel with the Chicago Lawyers Commission for Civil Rights. Juan Perea is the Kurt and Linda Rodin, Rodin, Rodin? Rodin, uh, professor of law and social justice at uh, Loyola University of Chicago School of Law. Juan is our uh, newbie this year. He, we, we welcome him to this panel for the, for the first time. Um, uh, to my left, Michael Scodro, a partner in the Supreme Court and appellate litigation practice of Mayor Brown, also a veteran of this program. And finally, one of the other veterans of this program, Stephen Schwinn, um, a professor of law at the University of Illinois Chicago Law School. So without further ado, um, I will ask uh, Colleen Connell to give us her thoughts about um, the Dobbs case, both the case itself and its implications going forward. Thank you, Steve. I'll take over to you here, Julie. Nice to meet you, Mr. Court. Um, so Steve asked me to go first um, to talk about the Dobbs case. I guess it's 
the obvious equation to me um, in the world terms of the board that was reduced um, last year to um, the first and third day in which um, so many of the students for Washington for this year will be um, as bad, if not worse, than the um, as bad as not worse as the term that just ended. So um, I'm gonna start by um, talking about the majority opinion, um, which was a six to three um, opinion overruling um, the Supreme Court's decision Roe versus Wade. Um, I'm then gonna talk about the um, uh, dissent and um, I wanna probably focus um, a little bit more attention on the, on the dissent because I think it obviously has the better, better of the arguments. Um, and just sort of overall, I'm gonna, I guess, cut to the conclusion and say that um, after a few months of reflecting on Dobbs, I remain very concerned about the following things. Um, I am particularly concerned, and I'm sure this is obvious to everybody um, in the room, um, that the majority um, decision really relegates women to second-class citizens under the Constitution. Um, and to say that that is a frightening and daunting prospect would be an understatement. Uh, I'm also very concerned that the majority's decision um, is one more step down the path of the court over privileging um, religion. And it's a very conservative traditional view of Christianity that the court, I think, over privileges. Um, and we saw so much of this in other decisions of the court um, in the term that, that ended in, in June, including its decision about um, the protected right of a football coach um, to pray at the 50 yard line and the um, court's decision with respect to funding um, and the requirement that if um, um, uh, the state of Maine was going to fund um, se um, secular um, um, high schools, um, it also had to fund um, uh, religious high schools um, or risk violating uh, the First Amendment of the Constitution. And finally, um, I'm really concerned uh, that the court's treatment of stare decisis uh, portends a new wave of a Hats on settled law in this country, uh, not just um, Justice Thomas's invitation to revisit um, the court's decisions in Lawrence versus Texas and Obergefell, um, protecting the rights of same-sex couples um, to have intimate relations and to marry, um, but so many other areas of jurisprudence. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to go straight to the majority opinion. And as everybody knows, um, the court overruled uh, uh, both Roe versus Wade and the court's um, decision in 1992 of Casey versus Planned Parenthood uh, reaffirming Roe, although tinkering a little bit with its, with its standards uh, of, of review. Uh, basically, the court in this decision um, rejected um, the notion uh, that the 14th Amendment's uh, due process clause uh, protected the right of a woman to decide uh, whether to terminate a pregnancy or to carry it to term. Um, just a little um, footnote, I don't know quite how you do it um, in oral, but a um, little footnote, I will use um, the term woman to describe uh, the impact of the court's decision and the, and the dissent. But I do wanna say specifically that, um, of course, um, you know this decision in Dobbs will affect everyone with a uterus, um, including transgender people and, um, uh, transgender people and non-binary people already face significant hurdles to um, exercising their constitutional rights, including their reproductive rights, and Dobbs will only make that um, challenge more pronounced. Um, so essentially, the court concluded that neither the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment or the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment protected the right of a woman to terminate a pregnancy. Um, um, they say basically, you know, abortion is nowhere mentioned in the Constitution. And because of that, we have to really look to see whether um, the right is such a part of our constitutional tradition uh, that it has to be uh, protected under some concept of, of ordered liberty. And the court concluded, or the majority concluded, um, that it was not so protected. Um, and it was not such an important part of our constitutional traditions as to fall within any concept of ordered liberty. Um, 
And then the majority took a trip down the historical memory lane uh, that I think was um, disingenuous at best. And, um, um, you know, really, I think uh, a, a falsehood in, in so many parts. And they basically said, you know, abortion was uh, not protected um, at the uh, time that the 14th Amendment was ratified. And then they did a deep dive into common law and conclude that, um, you know, because abortion is a deep moral question and it was basically not something uh, that anybody uh, who participated in the debates or the ratification of the 14th Amendment thought was protected, it therefore could not be protected, um, uh, you, know, you know, henceforth under the federal constitution. Um, so bad enough in terms of, I think, a very stunted, churlish approach to uh, reproductive rights, but the court's treatment of um, stare decisis is as troubling. Uh, they basically um, go through the motions of articulating the factors that the court has traditionally looked at in deciding whether it will reconsider and overrule prior constitutional precedent. Um, and again, I think the court's decision is quite frankly, um, not well taken and somewhat disingenuous. Um, what is particularly troubling, I, I think, to me, um, is the um, you know jumping into the concurrences, um, is Justice Thomas's concurrence, which I'm sure many, all of you have, have noted. The press has certainly noted, um, in which he concludes that the whole concept of substantive due process is an oxymoron. And uh, he says it's basically ludicrous to think that what is a procedural protection under the 14th Amendment could be thought to include any kind of protection for, um, for substantive fundamental rights. And he explicitly invites the court to look for opportunities to reconsider and overrule all of the court's prior decisions that are at least in part grounded in this concept of substantive due process. Uh, and um, he mentions by name um, the court's decision in Griswold protecting the right um, to use contraceptives. He specifically mentions by name uh, the right um, or the decisions in Lawrence versus Texas of same-sex intimacy and a Burgerfell versus Ohio, which is right of same-sex marriage. And uh, as uh, my friend and colleague Steve points out, uh, it was con con conspicuously obvious that he, he did not mention um, Loving versus Virginia. Um, but I would say um, I'll, I'll give him at least the um, slight benefit of the doubt because the actual text of Loving is equal protection. But um, I think that's not a whole lot of, of space. So very quickly, I'm getting my two minute warning. Um, Kavanaugh basically said the constitution is neutral on abortion and um, uh, basically we can turn it to the states, but he says it's at least as offensive as Roe to think that the constitution outlaws abortion. Um, the chief basically uh, concluded that the court majority went further than it should have that they could have upheld the Mississippi law, um, which banned all abortions after 15 weeks um, without overruling Roe, but nonetheless signed on to the court's opinion. Uh, the dissent, as I said, I think is the better part of the argument. Um, the dissent recognized the uh, majority um, opinion and the concurrences for the ideological rant that it is and basically said that the majority's stunted view of liberty really essentially deprives women of their status as equal citizens under the Constitution of the United States. Uh, the, the dissent written by Justice Breyer um, takes the majority to task for its inaccurate historical reference points out accurately that at the 14th uh, time of the 14th amendment, there was some legal protection um, for abortion and goes back and takes a couple swipes at the majority's treatment of common law and says basically um, common law at least did not criminalize it prior to quickening and I could go on and on. But I think most significantly the dissent really captures why the majority's opinion is so dangerous to women. And it basically says, um, 
the 14th Amendment was ratified by men. At the time that the 14th Amendment was ratified, women did not have any constitutional rights. Um, they were seen as appendages, legal appendages to their husbands and to their fathers before that. And that basically the court stunted view um, of, um, of the Constitution really seeks inappropriately to freeze our understanding of what the Constitution protects at a certain moment of time. And that is inconsistent, not only with Roe and Casey, but with really, quite frankly, I think the court's entire body of constitutional jurisprudence, um, probably uh, since the um, court um, after the initial um, West Coast versus Parish Hotel decision uh, decided that it was going to join the 20th century with the rest of the country and recognize that the Constitution was not frozen either at the time of ratification um, of the original document or the 14th, 15th, um, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. So I've gone a minute over. My apologies. Um, but um, thanks very much. Okay, all right. Uh, we, we try to select our panelists too based on expertise, and I should have mentioned when I was introducing her, um, Colleen's long history of advocacy and litigation on behalf of reproductive justice uh, and, and uh, uh, the work that she has done on this issue over many years. Our, our next two, in some broad sense, all of these cases deal with democracy, but uh, the next two cases, especially so, related to um, uh, the ability to vote, uh, the ability to have free and fair elections. Uh, Ami Gandhi uh, from the Chicago uh, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights is next. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Colleen. Really helpful note to start us off on. I'm Ami Gandhi, Senior Counsel with the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to advance racial equity. And I'm Senior Counsel at Chicago Lawyers Committee. I lead our organization's voting rights work for Illinois and Indiana. And every election, we have the privilege of getting to talk with voters over the phone and in person. We'll be doing so again this November. Hope many of you can join us for protecting voters' rights. In talking about the Milligan case, I, I want to share a little bit about who is this case about. The Alabama State Conference of the NAACP, Greater Birmingham Ministries, and individual Black voters in Alabama, including Evan Milligan, an activist in his community, leader of the nonpartisan organization Alabama Forward, brought this suit, this Section 2 Voting Rights Act suit, challenging the Alabama state legislature's drawing of congressional districts last year in 2021. Alabama, like most of the country, the state legislature has the power to use up-to-date census data and redraw congressional districts that determines which district someone is in when they go to get a ballot at election time and how much their vote matters and where their vote is counted. The plaintiffs argued that the way that the congressional map was drawn impermissibly diluted the votes of black people in Alabama. The state legislature, Alabama, the state of Alabama drew one congressional district out of seven that was majority black. And they could have drawn, as the plaintiffs argued, they could have drawn two majority black districts. One district out of seven rough math is about 14% of the population of Alabama would be residing in a majority black district. But when you look at the racial demographics, which people in Alabama very well know, um, they know their community, it's actually 27% of black voters in, uh, of voters in Alabama who are black. Now, I'm not suggesting that any exact proportional representation is a part of the law, it's not. But the underrepresentation there for Black people is really illuminating and revealing about the kind of disenfranchisement that people are facing there. This is also the first time that the Alabama State Legislature was put to task to draw, to redraw congressional districts since other parts of the Voting Rights Act were gutted in the recent 10 years through a steady stream of devastating Supreme Court decisions. The three judge panel at the lower court level unanimously agreed with the plaintiffs. 
they said this is not a close case. This is a clear cut case of the plaintiffs having shown sufficient evidence to meet the seminal standard, the prevailing precedent to unpack what are the threshold requirements for a claim brought under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act for a vote dilution case. The district court applied the Supreme Court precedent of the Jingles test. It's a case from the 1980s. The Supreme Court, excuse me, the district court, the three judge panel, by the way, two of the three judges were appointees of former President Donald Trump. And the three judge panel decided that all of the three Jingles threshold factors had been met. First of all, factor one, the court found that the plaintiffs had shown that an additional majority black district, you know, a second majority black congressional district could have been drawn. This is usually a pretty straightforward inquiry, looking at evidence, looking at maps, looking at numbers. The three judge panel also found the second factor that black voters in Alabama vote cohesively, that the voting patterns shown by empirical analysis shows that they vote similarly to each other. It's not just their race that brings them together, they have similar voting patterns. And third, last but not least, this threshold jingles factor, the district court found in favor of that as well, that the plaintiffs had shown what is a hard thing to show, but it's very clear and stark in Alabama, which is that white voters there vote in a way to defeat the candidate of choice of black voters to prevent black voters from being able to have an equal opportunity to vote. This is not just theoretical. This is not just a matter of math and statistics and maps. The area that was fragmented by this failure by the state of Alabama legislature to keep a black community whole, it's called the black belt of Alabama. It's called that because of fertile black soil in that part of the state. And in pre-Civil War times, it was a place where a large number of enslaved people were brought forcibly because of the agricultural conditions there. And it's a place where to this day, there are the vestiges of the past of slavery. To this day, it's a majority black population in many of the counties or in all of the counties of the Black Belt. It's a majority po black population or near majority, but they're now splintered into many different congressional districts. The state of Alabama challenged um, among many different creative challenges um, that as far as I can tell have not been accepted by federal courts before. The state of Alabama, instead of following the district court's order to draw an additional majority black district, the state of Alabama argued that plaintiffs hadn't even met the initial threshold test. And specifically, the state of Alabama claimed that it was unconstitutional for the plaintiffs to try to meet the threshold initial, usually easy to, easier to meet Jingles factor, that it was possible to draw a, an additional majority black district. It, it's puzzling to say the least, but following the state of Alabama's logic, um, I, I think I'm uh, getting this right and summarizing, that the state of Alabama was arguing that a race neutral computer simulated type of approach is constitutionally sound, but looking at actual demographic data of race is not constitutionally sound to meet a factor laid forth by Supreme Court precedent and followed by courts over the years in requiring through empirical analysis that plaintiffs show that it's possible to draw a majority people of color, or in this case, a majority black district. How to draw a majority black district and make that showing without looking at race, I'm not following, but this is what not just the state of Alabama, but many, many um, amicus parties have argued as well, you know, really alarmingly so. The Supreme Court on an emergency basis and what's called the shadow docket or lightning docket stayed the lower court's order as applied to 2022 elections. Even before any kind of hearing has taken place, there are gonna be oral arguments tomorrow. I know many of you will join me in listening in um, as NAACP Legal Defense Fund attorney, Duell Ross is going to be presenting the plaintiff's case before the Supreme Court tomorrow. Even before any kind of oral arguments or full briefing, the Supreme Court by plurality decision stopped the maps from being redrawn in time for the 2022 elections. So this November, when black voters go out to vote, 
they're going to be assigned to districts and get a corresponding ballot based on a map that the lower court, the three judge panel found to impermissibly dilute black voters power. There were a number of dissents from that Supreme Court decision that was early this year. So um, Justices Sotomayor, Breyer and Kagan penned a powerful dissent stating that, thank you, stating that the plaintiffs had met the sound tried and true test of section two of the Voting Rights Act, what's called the crown jewel of the civil rights movement, and that it was disruptive to democracy for the Supreme Court in this manner, in this very expedited um, shadow manner to disrupt that decision during an election year. Chief Justice Roberts dissented as well, saying that the way that the lower court decided is, is a textbook example of applying the accepted precedent of the jingles factors to a vote dilution claim. Chief Justice Roberts, however, also signaled that it that the section two precedent, including that jingles test, is confusing, famously elliptical, hard for judges and practitioners to apply. And so that could signal what we're all in for in terms of a decision on the merits that will come from this current Supreme Court term. Um, again, Alabama, state of Alabama has made its argument that it's unconstitutional, violating equal protection principles to um, look at race when bringing a section two claim. And civil rights advocates, you know, there has been an outcry from advocates and voters alike for this kind of um, perversion of this Voting Rights Act framework and having to go about proving a voting rights claim in a race neutral manner, simply put, is puzzling to say the least, if not impossible. And this kind of change in the law would make it enormously more difficult for plaintiffs to prevail in these cases. Plaintiffs, these are extraordinarily difficult cases to bring. They require a lot of resources even if someone brought forth that much of resources and for, for the plaintiffs and community members who are affected, it's not just about resources. They're putting themselves on the line to speak out against the political powers that be in their state in, and in their region. And it's not only hard to bring those kind of claims, but it is even harder to prevail. Research shows that only 49% of plaintiffs prevail in those kind of section two vote dilution cases. So whatever basis the court makes its decision this upcoming term, whether it's a narrow ruling as applied to this specific set of facts and Alabama's arguments, or if it's something broader, bringing to question even the validity of a broader framework around Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act or the voting rights, the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act itself. Um, these are dark times indeed. But we all know that to ensure our democracy, it's not just about case law. The, the picture ahead of us in terms of the case law does look bleak, but we know that social movements and the kind of change that we need to really strengthen our democracy is going to come more so from people power and social movements than cases alone and precedent alone. And so that's, that's the hope that we have to turn to at this point. You know, Our clients and redistricting challenges we've brought in Illinois, including the Illinois State Conference of the NAACP and others have been very clear and strident in their message to lawyers and the legal community. We have to continue the battle for the Voting Rights Act. We have to keep trying to ensure the protection of voting rights. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ami. The, the, the case that Ami discussed had to do with how people are represented. Um, the next case has to do with the power that institutions have, uh, government institutions have related to uh, voting matters. Uh, and to discuss that, we have Mike Scodro, who in addition to being a partner at Mayor Brown, is an expert on appellate litigation, a former faculty member of this law school, and a former solicitor general of the state of Illinois. And so we thought he would have some unique insight into this next case, which is about the power of state legislatures vis-a-vis -vis state Supreme Courts. Thanks very, thanks very much, Steve, and thanks uh, uh, for the invitation to be here yet again this year. I'm going to take my watch off and put it on the podium as any appellate litigator does, right? Um, so, so as not to go over past the red light. Um, the, the case I'm talking about today is called Moore versus Harper. It has not yet been set for argument. It's still in the initial briefing stages before the court. But briefly, and, and to sort of pick up where our last case left off, this too involves 
redistricting in the wake of the decennial census, something that states traditionally do every 10 years after they, uh, when they see population shifts in the state and so forth. In this case, North Carolina legislature redistricted their congressional districts in a way that um, really radically favored the uh, Republican uh, party. Um, the vast majority of the, of the congressional districts created by the new map were considered reliably Republican, and a number of voters led by Harper, our lead respondent in the case, challenged the redistricting on a number of grounds, uh, that this was an unlawful partisan gerrymander, and that it, um, uh, that it was uh, otherwise in violation of aspects of the North Carolina Constitution. So the North Carolina courts actually agreed with Harper and the other um, voting plaintiffs, and they struck down the map that the legislature had passed. And in its place, they adopted or embraced, the courts did, uh, a map that was drawn by three experts that had been selected by the courts. Oh, okay, sorry. Even closer, sounds so loud now. All right. Um, so the, the uh, uh, thank you. So the, the North Carolina courts struck down the legislative map. They embraced one that a group of experts uh, had, had drawn. And North Carolina legislatures, led by Moore, who is the speaker of the North Carolina House, brought suit um, or, or sought, I should say, U.S. Supreme Court review, and they wanted a stay of the U.S. Supreme Court. They wanted a stay that put to rest, put to one side, and joined enforcement of the expert map, the one that the North Carolina courts had embraced. And they wanted this done very quickly because the primary was coming up in May in North Carolina. This was late February at this point. So the Supreme Court ends up, um, we'll talk about what, where they land in a moment. Um, I'll keep you waiting for just a second on this. But what is the nature of the argument being made by the North Carolina legislators here? Well, this is what's called the independent state legislature theory. And it's something that you're hearing a lot about, uh, not only because of this case, but I would say chiefly this case, at least in terms of the coming uh, Supreme Court term. Well, what is this theory? This theory derives from the following language from the Constitution. It says that times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. The theory is that because this provision refers specifically to the legislature as opposed to just the state, that the state legislature alone, even to the exclusion of state courts, has sole authority to regulate the time, place, and manner of federal elections, including in this case, to set district boundaries. So under that theory, the, the North Carolina courts, including the North Carolina Supreme Court, had no role to play whatsoever legally as a federal constitutional matter in the process. But what's the pedigree of this theory that we're now hearing so much about? Well, people will trace it back to a version of this uh, sort of same idea advanced by Justice, then Chief Justice Rehnquist's concurrence in Bush v. Gore, going back 20 years. Uh, those are, uh, folks may recall that he, joined by Justices Scalia and Thomas, joined the majority but then wrote separately to note that a separate provision, the electors clause of the Constitution, which has to do not with senators and representatives but with presidential electors, also refers to the legislature of the states. And there's language in Justice Rehnquist's concurrence in that decision to the effect that the legislature here, or this, the courts rather, the Florida Supreme Court in that case, had overstepped its federal constitutional bounds by um, uh, moving, by expanding the, the time permitted, changing a deadline that the legislature had set and that this was unconstitutional. Well, fast forward 20 years to 2020 to a case that I'm sure many people will remember, and this was the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. This was the instance in which the uh, U.S. Supreme Court rejected a, a stay request, or actually in that case, it was a request for expedited consideration on the merits uh, by Pennsylvania Republicans of a Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision that had extended the time for counting mail-in ballots. There was a legislative provision that required that mail-in ballots be received by the end of election day to be counted, and this, the state high court, you may well recall, ex expen, uh, extended that deadline by three days. So 
In that case, the court, again, they denied the request for emergency relief, in that case from Pennsylvania Republicans. They, they decided not to hear that case on an expedited basis, but there was a separate opinion by Justice Alito joined by Justices Thomas and Gorsuch that came out in late October of 2020, very shortly before the presidential election. And that separate writing noted that, yeah, there really wasn't time to handle that case on an expedited basis on the eve of the presidential election, but, but Justice Alito joined by two other justices noted that there was merit to the position being advanced in that case by the Pennsylvania Republicans. And that position is this same independent state legislature theory. So that's sort of the pedigree that preceded the request for the stay in the North Carolina case. Well, the Supreme Court denied that request too. They denied it in early March of this year. And I'm sure many recall that decision. Here though, four justices wrote separately not just three. Justice Kavanaugh concurred. He agreed that there was no time, it was too close to the North Carolina primaries for the U.S. Supreme Court to be intervening in the case. But, but Justice Kavanaugh did say that this independent state legislature theory is important. And it, it's a theory that the court ought to grapple with soon. He didn't necessarily tip his hand as to which way he would go on the merits of the issue, but he certainly urged his colleagues on the court to take up the issue. Well, Justice Alito wrote separately yet again, as he had in the Pennsylvania case, and he was not as, um, uh, I would say, uh, he, he, would, he tipped his hand as to where he thinks the merits of the case lie. Justice Alito joined, um, again, by the same, uh, the uh, Justices uh, Thomas and Gorsuch wrote, because uh, it is a stay application, so one of the elements is likelihood of success on the merits. He opined that they should grant the stay because the uh, Speaker Moore and the other Republican challengers in this case, uh, in, in the view of Justice um, uh, Alito, had in fact stated uh, it were likely to, to uh, prevail on the merits of their claim. So it was denied, at least the stay was, but you have four justices writing separately, speaking of the importance of the issue and three actually discussing the merits of the issue and suggesting that there was merit to the claim. Well, following the denial of the stay, the petitioners in the case filed a traditional cert petition and that traditional cert petition was granted. Uh, and that's why we have it on the court's docket for this coming year. Thank you. Um, so uh, what, what do we expect? Well, we have, as I said, the opening briefs have been filed. They are very much along the lines that we've talked about. They derive from this language um, in the, this elections clause. They also, um, not surprisingly, consistent with the way the court has been resolving uh, significant constitutional questions, as you've been hearing, uh, devotes significant part of the brief to history as well. Um, what can we expect from the other side? Well, we don't have their merits briefs yet, but um, I have sort of distilling the merits part of the brief in opposition to the cert petition that was filed by the, by the state of North Carolina, by their attorney general's office. They're going to make a historical argument as well uh, that, uh, that it's actually consistent with longstanding history for non-legislative state officials to play a role in federal elections. They're also going to make an argument, uh, again, this is based on their opposition to the cert petition. They're going to make an argument that the Supreme Court has effectively resolved this question in the past by um, upholding regimes in which non-legislative officials uh, played a significant role in federal elections. And then finally, there's also a federalism argument to be made that I suspect we'll see in the merits brief as well. And there's also a very practical argument that the state has advanced and I assume will continue to advance on the merits. And that is that if the court were to adopt the independent state legislature theory, um, that it seriously risks uh, chaos in all 50 states that rely on non judicial or excuse me, non-legislative officers uh, to play an important role in their uh, federal election process. So uh, those briefs are not due until the 19th of October. You can all find them online when they're filed. We'll see exactly what the respondents argue, but I think um, that probably provides an outline of what we can expect to see.
Mike, Mike, thank you. We said that, um, you know, in some sense, all of these cases involve democracy. But in 2003, in Grutter versus Bollinger, um, Justice O'Connor's opinion for the court recognized, among other things, that democracy requires for it to work well a cadre of well trained, well educated college graduates um, uh, coming into a diverse and multicultural society. Um, two cases that Professor Juan Perea will be talking about uh, will tell us whether that precedent will stand or not this coming term. Uh, yes, thank you. And uh, thanks to ACS uh, for inviting me to be with you. And thanks for being here. So I have two cases to cover. I may talk quickly because uh, uh, closer. OK, excellent. So uh, to begin with the affirmative action case, um, Students for Fair Admissions which is a, apparently a professional anti-affirmative action litigating organization, is suing Harvard and the University of North Carolina, challenging their affirmative action program. So SFFA, the Students for Fair Admissions, this is run by Edward Blum, who has financed a lot of the anti-affirmative action litigation in the country, including the Fisher case. And his colleagues at SFFA are Abigail Fisher, the plaintiff from the Fisher case, who can't seem to give it up, no matter what it takes, and her father. So they're, they're on a mission, I don't know from whom, but it's not so helpful. And, and in addition, you know, it wasn't enough to sue Harvard and UNC, they're also suing University of Texas again, and Yale. So, but those have been stayed pending resolution in the Harvard case and, and North Carolina. So um, I'll talk about the Harvard case first. Harvard's being sued under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Harvard has a pretty extensive application process uh, to get in. It has six parts. Uh, one is uh, Harvard's pre-application recruitment efforts, then student submission of applications, Harvard's first read of the applications, admissions officer and alumni interviews, subcommittee meetings of admissions officers, to recommend applicants, and then full admissions committee meetings to make and communicate final decisions. And along the way, Harvard also uses a system of tips for certain students, like uh, legacy admits, and in some instances, tips on account of the race of students. Uh, the district court did a pretty extensive analysis of Harvard's uh, process and found that it passed strict scrutiny. And Basically, it was a holistic admissions process without undue consideration of race. They took race into account, but as part of a whole process. Uh, North Carolina is also being sued. North Carolina is sued under the Constitution, the Equal Protection Clause. And in the North Carolina case, there's no allegation of discrimination against Asian students. And there's some evidence of current bias on the campus. So those two things, uh, distinguish it from, from the Harvard case. Uh, North Carolina was also found to have a holistic admissions process without undue consideration of race. And then the Supreme Court uh, reached out and granted cert after just the district court opinion. So that's how they both uh, got there. In, in Massachusetts, it was a district court opinion and then court of appeals, basically approving of Harvard's process. So in the Supreme Court, the question, a uh, couple of questions presented, should the court overrule Grutter versus Bollinger and prohibit institutions of higher education from using race in admissions? And then second, is Harvard violating Title VI by penalizing Asian American applicants or engaging in racial balancing or overemphasizing race throughout its admissions process or failing to consider workable alternatives? Now, the current standards are stated in the Grutter and Fisher cases that you're probably familiar with. And in both cases, uh, student body diversity might be a compelling interest. Universities have to prove that their interest is compelling. Uh, and the, the ways of considering race have to be narrowly tailored. And so there are certain principles that come from the cases. One is that a race conscious admissions program can't be narrowly tailored if it implements a quota or racial balancing. Second, 
a race conscious program is not narrowly tailored if a university uses it despite having workable alternatives. Uh, third, no deference is owed to a university in assessing the narrow tailoring, tailoring or compelling interest with respect to diversity. And that's about it. That's what the court is gonna to have to consider. So just a few conclusions, um, tentative conclusions that I draw from this is the basic affirmative action is very likely to be struck down, I think. In the Harvard case, it's likely to be a six to two vote because Katanji Brown Jackson has recused herself from that case. Uh, she's a member of Harvard's board of advisors and so she's not participating. And in the North Carolina case, probably six to three. Uh, why do I think this? Uh, the conservative majority that we're witnessing is hostile to race conscious remedies and has been. And uh, we're observing a very different court right now. Uh, before you had Justices Kennedy and Ginsburg and Breyer on the court, with Kennedy being the swing vote with respect to affirmative action classifications. Now, uh, Kennedy, Ginsburg, and Breyer are all gone, and we have uh, Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh replacing, forgetting who he replaced, but Kavanaugh and then uh, Justice Coney Barrett uh, replacing Justice Ginsburg. So it's a much more conservative court, I think, than we've had in many decades, and they're likely to, uh, to strike down uh, affirmative action. The debate, I think, is unfortunate, and it has been, in my opinion, since the Baki case, because the discourse that we have about it reinforces a false imagery about race and affirmative action. The, the basic imagery seems to be that whites are innocent victims of affirmative action and that blacks are guilty perpetrators. Um, in this case, we have Asian American students, not whites who are claiming some sort of victimhood. But the doctrine itself, much of the objection is based on the idea that it unfairly favors blacks and that it injures whites. And a much sounder basis would be that, that affirmative action is actually a remedy for past discrimination. All of these institutions discriminated on the basis of race for most of their longevity, and they all know it. And uh, we don't discuss it this way, but they are attempting to make up for their own well-known histories of racial discrimination, including the Ivies, including Harvard. Princeton was particularly bad. So I, in, in good conscience, they could do it on a basis of reparations or remedy for past discrimination. And arguments about affirmative action uh, conflate a couple of issues, I think, especially in the Harvard case. One is affirmative action itself. To, to the extent we're saying the affirmative action violates equal protection, there was no evidence in any of the cases that Asian American students were affected at all by affirmative action. And there was no evidence, or, or the, the judges at the District and Court of Appeals level found no intentional discrimination against Asian American students. They were basically stronger in some categories and less strong in other categories. And on balance, it was found to be non-discriminatory. So the affirmative action program, yes, SFFA is attacking it, and probably the plaintiffs have standing, but it's not really the source of any injury here. Most of the case is about whether Harvard intentionally discriminates against Asians, and both lower courts found that Harvard didn't discriminate. Okay. So my second case is Brackeen versus Holland, which is uh, about the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And where am I time-wise? More than two minutes. Okay, <laughs> that's better than, better than less than two minutes. Okay, a little closer. So um, this is about the constitutionality of the Indian Child Welfare Act which is a really important piece of legislation that Congress enacted to protect Indian nations from uh, abusive child welfare practices that were pretty rampant uh, before this statute was enacted. The 
the harm that the statute sought to relieve was that um, large numbers of Indian children were being uh, separated from their families. And it's still true. Something like uh, Indian children are about two and a half times overrepresented in terms of foster care and adoptive placements than other people. So this is still happening. Congress found as part of the statute that there's no resource more vital to the continued existence and integrity of Indian tribes than their children. And that the United States has a direct interest as trustee in protecting Indian children who are members of or are eligible for membership in an Indian tribe. Some of the arguments against the statute try to raise the fact that this has nothing to do with uh, Indian sovereignty or Indian power. And that's just not true at all. If we think about the ability to um, protect and contain people subject to jurisdiction, that, that is an essential part of sovereignty for every people, including native people. So there are two uh, definitions that are, I, I've distilled this down a lot, and that's a good thing. It's quite a complicated case, and there, there are many, many issues. There was a, a remarkably fractured Court of Appeals opinion. It consisted of six separate opinions, numbering 265 pages. You know, could have been a bestseller. Probably won't be, but... Okay, so the, the issue here is that um, the ICWA, Indian Child Welfare Act, defines Indian, Indian child broadly to include any unmarried person who is under age 18 and is either a member of an Indian tribe or is eligible for membership in an Indian tribe and is the biological child of a member of an Indian tribe. The second provision is that it prescribes that in any custody proceeding involving an Indian child, preference is given to placing the child with a member of the child's extended family, other members of the child's tribe, or other Indian families rather than non-Indian adoptive parents. So I will summarize very draconianly and say that the individual plaintiffs are families that sought to adopt an Indian child with the consent of the parents of the Indian child, then native nations intervened in order to preserve the, uh, the ranking in the Child Welfare Protection Act. So the individual plaintiffs are the families who whose process was uh, adopted a little bit or uh, interfered with, they would say, when Indian nations intervened. So basically, there are three big issues. One is whether the, the Indian Child Welfare Act violates equal protection principles. And a subheading of that one would be whether Indians are a racial classification requiring strict scrutiny. There are two different lines of cases. Uh, Morton v. Mankari considered designations as Indian to be a political rather than a racial classification. But in Rice v. Cayetano in the year 2000, a non-tribal Indian group was not recognized at all and was found to be a, a racial classification. A uh, second issue is whether Congress has power to pass the statute. Uh, and an argument for is that uh, Congress has a plenary power to make rules that are rationally related to preserving Indian sovereignty. And the argument against is that Congress is overreaching by supplanting state interests, uh, best interests of the child. Um, a, a few years back, you may remember a case made it to the Supreme Court involving a baker of wedding cakes from Colorado. Um, I got to write an op-ed for the New York Times about that piece, and the headline, the immortal headline was, even the Bernini of buttercream must serve gay couples. Um, sure. The case ended up in various reasons being not quite punted, but not reaching the major First Amendment questions that the baker and his lawyers had posed. But um, our next panelist, Steve Schwinn from University of Illinois Chicago Law School, will talk about a case um, this fall where those same lawyers are back in court um, hoping to take another crack at those First Amendment arguments this time. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, panelists, and thank you, everybody, for being here. What an exciting time to be back in person, right? 
So good to see familiar faces from our past years. And uh, I don't see our online friends, but, uh, but welcome to our online friends as well. 140 online friends, that's outstanding. Well, um, thank you for putting this together, everybody who had a role in it. It's really nice to be back in person. So I am going to talk about the sort of new version of the Masterpiece Cake Shop and add to the kind of parade of horribles that we've heard about today. Um, the case that I, well, actually, before I do that, let me just make a comment. If one of the themes that you're detecting in what you're hearing today is that the Supreme Court is particularly reaching out for cases to hear, that's true. We heard it from a couple of panelists, most recently from Juan, in the affirmative action cases. These are not cases that the Supreme Court has to take up and deal with really hard issues and overturn decades of precedent. No, not at all. These are cases that the court is reaching out to take up and carve new ground, find new rules, and really change the Constitution in very fundamental ways. And the first case that I'll talk about falls in that line. It's called 303 Creative. This is the case of, a, it's fundamentally, it, it's like Masterpiece Cake Shop in that it pits religious liberties versus non-discrimination. This involves a website designer in Colorado who has kind of gone out on her own and said she wants to design websites that are consistent with her religious beliefs and her passions. So she sets up shop and she starts designing websites, but, and she wants to put on her own website that she'll be happy to design websites for people, whoever they are, even for weddings, but she won't design websites for same-sex weddings, right? Now, we saw this coming. Of course we did. We've seen dozens of these cases in and around Masterpiece Cake Shop and since Masterpiece Cake Shop, but now this one is coming up to the Supreme Court. And at first blush, we think, okay, so this is another case dealing with religious liberties on the one hand and non-discrimination on the other, right? <clears throat> As it turns out, She's in Colorado, exactly where Masterpiece Cake Shop was, and subject to the exact same non-discrimination law that was at issue in Masterpiece Cake Shop, the Colorado non-discrimination law that prohibits discrimination against gays and lesbians by sexual orientation. So she says, I can't put up on my website an indication that I won't make websites for same-sex weddings because of the Colorado law. Now note, she hasn't been asked to make such a website. The Colorado Civil Rights Commission hasn't punished her for making such a website. And this is what I mean by the Supreme Court, not only you know, breaking dramatically new ground in its rulings, but actually reaching out for cases to do this. But it's doing it in another important way in 303 Creative. So the way I've pitched this is religious liberties versus non-discrimination, right? And that's the way she pleaded the case too. And remember, that's the way the plaintiff did in Masterpiece Cake Shop, free exercise versus the Colorado Civil Rights uh, Act. Well, as it turns out, the Supreme Court granted cert not on the religion claim, but on the free speech claim. Her theory is that by designing a website that inherently is speech and the Colorado Civil Rights Commission by requiring her to make a website for same-sex weddings is compelling her speech in violation of the First Amendment. For her, it's a compelled speech case. So she's pitched this as compelled speech the, uh, the Colorado authorities in the United States, as amicus in the case, have pitched it not as a speech case at all, but rather as a regulation of conduct. And what they've said is, even if it is a speech case, we have compelling reasons for non-discrimination. And that is to make sure that everybody has access to these public accommodations, like websites, who after all are sanctioned and authorized by the state to set up shop and operate within the state, right? They get some benefits. And so along with those benefits come some requirements. Now, what's interesting about the case is that it comes to the court as a free speech case, right? Many of us have long been watching this court worried that it's going to take up a free exercise case like Masterpiece Cake Shop or like 303 Creative and do dramatic damage to the free exercise clause. In particular, overturned Smith. 
Now, the court has moved incrementally in that direction. And Colleen mentioned, and I'll just remind you because maybe we need another piece of bad news today, that the Supreme Court has all but dismantled any wall of separation that there is between church and state this past term in two key cases. This is, uh, follows a long trend line on the court. And what we see now is that religion is not only invited to participate more in public, but required to participate more in public policy. And I think this case is going to follow that line. Interestingly, not under the religion clause, but rather under free exercise. I'm sorry, not under free exercise, rather under uh, free speech. And so what we expect is that the court will probably rule in favor of the plaintiffs in this case, on free speech grounds. This is a court that's long been on a tear to promote free speech against all other values. And so to promote free speech here as well against the non-discrimination values of the Colorado authorities. Now, if it does, this could have vast implications, right? You can think, just use your imagination of number of businesses that can claim that their activity involves speech as against some form of non-discrimination. Now here we're talking about non-discrimination by sexual orientation, but there's no limiting principle. If it's not a compelling interest to include people on an equal basis in public accommodation, then it's not a compelling interest to do that for anybody, right? And so we can think about the vast sweep of this opinion. It'll apply to enhance not only religious claims against non-discrimination, but other kinds of claims as well in all manner of, uh, of businesses and could, could have significant, significant consequences. Um, do I have a couple of seconds to mention the other case? Three minutes. So let me just mention really quickly another case that's on my radar screen, United States versus Texas. Um, the Biden administration, you might remember, uh, adopted some guidance for DHS and Border Patrol agents when, um, when they're identifying unauthorized non-citizens in the United States to apprehend and deport them. The reason the Biden administration need, needed guidance on this score is that by most accounts, we have about 11 million unauthorized non-citizens in the country but Congress has appropriated enough money for DHS to apprehend and deport only a small fraction of that number. And yet the law requires DHS to apprehend and deport them. And so the administration really is in a tough spot here. In order to comply with the law, it's got to deport everybody, but it doesn't have nearly enough money to do that. And so the administration quite reasonably adopted guidelines for the apprehension and deportation of unauthorized non-citizens. It said, look, when we're prioritizing apprehension and, and uh, deportation, we expect our officers to identify folks who pose a national security threat, who pose a criminal threat, or who po pose a border security threat. And that's going to be the order of priority that uh, authorities look to when they're apprehending and deporting unauthorized non-citizens. Well, that didn't sit well with the state of Texas. And so Texas sued. Texas went forum shopping here and found a particularly friendly judge in Texas who was willing to grant a nationwide injunction against the Biden administration for violating the Administrative Procedure Act. Uh, Louisiana was part of the suit as well. So now there's a nationwide injunction upheld by the Fifth Circuit and the case then is going to the Supreme Court on whether the Biden administration's guidance violates the Administrative Procedure Act. This is a really important case for a lot of different reasons. Obviously, immigration policy, right? This case will say a lot about the administration's ability to implement its own immigration policy in, uh, in light of the APA, the INA, and other immigration laws, and of course, Congress's authorization of resources to enforce those laws. But it also says something about the Administrative Procedure Act and how deferential the court's going to be to this administration as opposed to the prior administration on issues of immigration under the Administrative Procedure Act. And it's important for standing purposes. One of the claims in the case is that Texas doesn't have standing to lodge this suit, right? Why would it? Well, the courts below said that Texas does have standing. 
And so if the court grants standing to a case like this, that could invite other states to bring similar types of APA claims against the administration on other spurious grounds. If it rejects standing, hopefully we'll return some sort of measure of sanity in this area of the law. And I think with that, I'll just stop. Thank you. I'm not uh, certain whether this is relevant to those here or just the people online, but the magic word or the code word for your CLE paperwork that um, you, you need to fill in uh, when you complete the CLE form is reform, R-E-F-O-R-M. I guess maybe that suggests that's what we're all hoping for is reform of this Supreme Court. Um, along those lines, what we will have some time, a little time for q and I'd like to just ask just one quick question of all the panelists. I know it's a, a big question, so it, it, it may be foolish to ask for some quick thoughts, but um, Andy Koppelman, who many of us know, Northwestern law professor, uh, not someone I think of as typically associated with the sort of cynical re legal realism school about the Supreme Court, has a new op-ed, I just saw it this morning in The Hill, in which he said, Chief Justice, he's talking about how Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kagan have been talking about the court's legitimacy. Roberts is right that American democracy pens, depends on respect for courts, but the courts have to act like courts. This Supreme Court is acting, uh, is something else, a wielder of power that is increasingly constrained by nothing. Perhaps we should call it the Supreme not a court. Um, and one of the questions from David Melton, a longtime um, ACLU and ACS supporter, uh, asks what you all think of term limits. So, um, we, you know, we, we've got about 17 minutes left altogether. We'd like to get to a few more questions. Um, any thoughts you want to offer about, you know, are you ready to give up hope on the Supreme Court's legitimacy? Is there still hope? Is there anything that could be done to reform it? Uh, short term, I think the court has squandered its legitimacy. Um, I think as a lawyer, and I think as somebody who thinks that um, respect for the rule of law, which requires respect for courts, um, is absolutely essential to avoid um, chaos. I think we have to think about how uh, we work as a legal community um, and to try to restore that legitimacy. Um, but short term, I don't think um, that's going to be possible. Uh, I have serious constitutional questions, though, about term limits. I don't know if it's consistent in any way with Article 3. Um, I think um, that the um, prospect of um, increasing the size of the court is clearly constitutional, um, but has many, many, many political ramifications, as everybody in the room and online is familiar with. So uh, a short term, I think we're stuck with this, and we have to really look to the other tools in um, our arsenal, um, including, as Emmy said, you know, really, um, you know, grassroots power, you know, working with state legislatures, state courts, um, and, you know, ultimately, you know, appealing to our, our fellow citizens to really um, do what's right, vote what's right. And um, it's gonna be a, a, an ultra marathon, not just a marathon. David and all, I'm going to give a non-answer to the specific question about term limits. We don't have a position on that at this time, but I really do think it's a healthy thing and a worthwhile endeavor to talk about legitimacy. I don't think it should have to be taboo, and I certainly don't think it should have to be partisan to talk about the legitimacy issues with the current Supreme Court. We should question the legitimacy of all of our institutions, including the baked-in racial inequity that we see in our court system, including in the Supreme Court system, including in the current Supreme Court actions. So I hope that those discussions continue. Um, the only thing I'll chip into this is one interesting theory, I think an academic theory I've heard about term limits is you could do it, you could say there's an 18 year term, but the constitution guarantees um, essentially service on your judicial appointment for good behavior, it doesn't guarantee you a seat on any particular court. And so the argument goes after 18 years or whatever, you would move from the Supreme Court to a court of appeals or a district court. Well, uh, it's hard to, to, to add a lot to this. I mean, I think that we, we've seen, you know, crises of legitimacy at the Supreme Court a couple of times in our 
kind of recent lifetime. There was obviously one in the immediate wake of Bush v. Gore that was was widely discussed. I think um, this is no doubt another. And, you know, I do think it's going to, if this is going to heal, I think it will certainly take some some significant time, whether or not that, you know, uh, it kind of encourages the court to take a few to uh, have a, a few quieter terms. Uh, it, that's certainly not what we're seeing at this point in terms of the the courses the court's case selection. So they certainly don't seem, you know, bent in that direction. But I, I, I you know, I'm sort of cautiously optimistic that over time these um, kind of legitimacy issues will uh, will resolve. Um, I guess I'll add two things. The first one is how startling it is that we're talking about Chief Justice Roberts as the kind of moderating force on the court. Remember, this is the guy who wrote Shelby County, who wrote Parents Involved, right? This is no incrementalist, and yet he's the moderating force on this court. Wow. The second thing I'd say is we hear a lot about about, you know, sort of changing the composition of the court in one way or another, including term limits. One thing that to me is puzzlingly not part of the conversation is restricting the court's appellate jurisdiction. Why isn't Congress, when you've got Democrats in control of both houses and the White House, writing legislation to restrict the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is utterly beyond me. And I hold Democrats accountable for that. Uh, nicely said, Steve. I, I couldn't agree more. I think uh, we're in desperate times, uh, and desperate times with uh, momentum in an anti-egalitarian direction. And it will continue unless we do something like adjust the court's appellate jurisdiction, like enlarge the court. I, I would be open to anything that would curb their power to continue doing damage to really, really hard won gains over many decades. Uh, no, no single group of people should be able to cause so much damage in such a short time. So I would do whatever it takes to curb their power. And it, as Steve mentioned, it's so disappointing that Democrats have done nothing, literally nothing. And the irony is they could, they're not passing legislation either, but if they did, the Supreme Court would then rule on its validity in all likelihood keep applying itself and striking things down. So it's just stupid not to curb the court in some way. Um, we have some time for a question from the audience. Alan. Uh, sort of, uh, sure, I have two related points. I should compact just if possible. Just Very quick for, I think this is for Steve and Steve. One, uh, a little dilation on the historical concept of legislature might be in order because there's been a lot of discussion about what that encompasses at the state level, as I've seen in the literature. And second of all, how on earth, this is for Steve on free speech versus non-discrimination specifically, how on earth is the Supreme Court gonna reconcile the Fifth Circuit's decision in the social media case where, where a state is attempting to control the editorial policies of social media first this other decision that's working its way up. So those are my two questions. So that, that's actually fortuitous because it covers one of the questions from the audience as well, which also asked about uh, if websites are uh, free speech, will, uh, will that open the door for people to sue social media to not moderate posts that contain lies, sort of a variation on the Fifth Circuit decision. So. Yeah, and just on that point, so yeah, I think there is a tension there. I don't expect this court, quite frankly, to be concerned about tensions between different doctrines and different areas. It's already said to us quite clearly, we are going to do what we want to do, the law, precedent, history be damned. Um, I think that was the clear message of Dobbs and Bruin and the two religion cases that I had mentioned from this past term among others. I mean, we could go West Virginia versus EPA, for example. But um, the Supreme Court just this morning did grant cert in, yet yeah, right, in the, um, in the, uh, the, the case involving uh, statutory exemptions for social media platforms um, in, uh, in free speech cases. And so we're going to hear from them soon. 
Uh, I caught it on my newsfeed. I haven't had a chance to look at that. But again, do I expect the court to be consistent here? Absolutely not. And I, I you, you know, I'll go even a step further. I think the court will be in our face inconsistent because that's what it's shown already. It, so many issues with the horribleness of this court, including national injunctions were bad when uh, Trump was involved and now they're great, you know, they're the, they're the greatest thing. But my question is for you, Mike, Michael, do you think that the Supreme Court will listen to the conference of uh, state chief justices, all 56 submitted a unanimous brief uh, suggesting that the state legislatures can be reviewed by uh, courts, just like any other legislative enactment when they are unconstitutional. Do you think that the Supreme Court will take that into account or they're just gonna dismiss uh, their brethren at the state level? Now, it's a great question. Uh, you know, my sense is that we'll certainly read that with some care. I mean, there are a lot of amicus briefs in this case. There will be a ton. It's becoming harder and harder, quite frankly, to read all of the briefs uh, for anyone in a given case. But I think that one will get special attention. You know, my my sense has been you know, that that is kind of you know, it's coming from the the very folks that, you know, you would expect it to come from in a sense. And in that regard, I, I'm not sure how much extra oomph it will have. I think an amicus brief on behalf of, you know, speakers of, of state houses of representatives and other members of state legislative leadership would be, could, could be potentially hugely influential in the process. We've occasionally seen those so-called surprising source amicus briefs have pretty extraordinary power in other cases. Um, think, think back to the uh, former prison wardens who wrote in favor of, of the inmate in the case involving um, hair and beard length. So, um, I think that would be more powerful. I think it'll be read, but I, I really am not, I'm not thinking it's going to carry any, you know, sort of significant extra weight only because it's, it's coming from the, the, the folks whose ox will be gored regardless. And so I think that in that, in that sense, they may not give too much extra heft to it, but just my own guess. Let me, um, uh, uh, read one question online. Uh, it, it's a bit general, but maybe I'll ask Colleen if she wants to take it on because, uh, it, it, it really, the, the, it, it echoes, I think, something said in the Dobbs case. Why are U.S. history and tradition given such weight despite clear judicial recognition of marginalization, disenfranchisement, oppression of historically and traditionally uh, minoritized groups? Uh, Colleen, I was thinking of you because um, the Dobbs case in kind of setting the course for the future of substantive due process basically said we're only concerned with unenumerated rights that can be grounded in our history and tradition. Do you have thoughts about this kind of reverence for history and tradition when it comes to deciding what is and is not a constitutional right? Uh, history is written by the victors. And um, I think this is an attempt um, by the historical victors of um, uh, white Christian men in this country um, to basically um, you know, rely on that old history and sort of um, give it a new burst of, um, you know, continuing, you know, um, force. And, um, you know, uh, you know, more um, judiciously perhaps, um, you know, I think um, it is appropriate by and large to look at history um, when interpreting, um, for example, a constitution, which, um, you know, taking up what the dissent said in Dobbs, um, you know, uh, quoting the first justice or chief justice Marshall, um, you know, um, it was a, a document intended to stand for the ages and it was not a document um, that um, the framers intended to be interpreted um, based on any one point in time, I think it's the language Dobbs used, and that the framers anticipated and rightly so that the constitution would basically endure and evolve to meet um, the very changing times and to you know, just go back to um, perhaps one of the um, earlier articulators of the originalism, which is um, Justice Scalia in his Jones case involving um, the Fourth Amendment um, and whether it applied to make um, unconstitutional um, a tracing device that was attached to somebody's car, you know, he recognized that, you know, the principle of a person being 
safe in his person or property from unwarranted governmental searches um, was what was motivating uh, the court's decision. Although footnote, he then again did appeal to Congress um, to actually enact a, a federal privacy act, which took into account um, some of the more invasive and more modern technologies, which did not necessarily require a physical invasion or intrusion on space. And so I think that, you know, again, looking to those historical principles, which can be, you know, I think elucidated by a look at history is important, but not the way, um, you know, this court, um, its majority really uh, distorts history. Is that a good word about originalism that I heard from the executive director of the ACLU of Illinois? <laughs> principles. Okay. Um, in the back, I thought I saw some hand, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. The, the yes, on the aisle here. Oh, uh, I don't think I need well, so the people, okay, maybe so the people on Zoom can hear you though. Okay. Hi, this is a question about procedure. You know, we had that leaked opinion in the Dobbs case. I, I am not aware that this has happened before and wondered what the purpose of it was and we might if we might see it again was in an effort to kind of curb the blow of it or incite some people it's, it's very confusing. Leak uh, I, I guess I, I have been personally more persuaded by the theory that it came from one of the chambers of one of the one of the majority justices, the conservative justices, that was an effort to lock in the opinion to prevent Justice Kavanaugh or someone else from going wobbly uh, and, and perhaps changing their vote under the sway of the chief justice or something like that. I've I've read you know people who have tried to write arguments you know theories from both sides. That's the one I find the I personally find more persuasive, but anyone else have a, we have one more question in the back we want to get to. Any other quick thoughts about the leak? Okay, then we have time for one last question. Yes. Oh, um, I wanna follow up two comments that you made in light of yesterday's op-ed in the New York Times calling President Biden a bystander in this whole debate. So I wonder if you believe he's merely a bystander compared to FDR, what he should do and whether the Supreme Court would really listen to him. Yeah, it's quite a disappointing set of circumstances all around. So is he a bystander? He's certainly not leading. He's not, uh, I'm not even aware that he's criticized the court very much, maybe a little bit with respect to the Dobbs decision, but otherwise he hasn't led in terms of doing anything about the court. He appointed a commission that basically said nothing. They, they you know, it's distinguished commission. They made no recommendations. And so, it, you know, the, the actions that can be taken are pretty clear but he's not doing any of it. So I don't know, I, I don't know what to say. It, it, the court will keep doing what it's doing unless there's some change in the basic dynamics, we're just in for more of the same, which to me is unacceptable, but you know, I don't get to decide. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have anything to add to that. It is disappointing that we're not hearing more from the administration and congressional Democrats pushing back against the court. Maybe it'll become more of an issue as we head toward the midterms, but we're already well into the election season. So I, you know, I'm just, I guess I'm not really hopeful on that score. I'm, I'm gonna dissent slightly. I, I feel like it's a little bit like blaming um, the victims here. Um, maybe overstating it just a, a little bit. Um, and I have to say that, um, as being you know, part of um, an organization um, that has policy, for example, against um, the ACLU taking positions in support of or in opposition to a nomination. Part of it is based on our nonpartisanship, 
But when you look at our legislative history, part of it is based on concern for the fact that the ACLU is before the court, the court so often. And, you know, you, you don't want to, you know, make any bad blood that you don't have to do. So I, I think that um, there's a, you know, a role for, you know, obviously the Democrats and the, and the um, you know, the administration to be, you know, more outspoken on the issues. Um, you know, but really, quite frankly, I think the animus ought to be directed at the people who nominated and appointed these, um, you know, the, these judges. And um, we ought to be, uh, you know, I think the concern about the commission is very well taken, though. I mean, we ought to be looking at ways that we can restore the legitimacy of the court and have some, um, you know, I think concern for real quality. I mean, I think the other thing that is unstated here, um, and I think that, um, Judge Eileen Cannon is Exhibit A, is the fact that, um, you know, the Republican Party in general has nominated people who do not have the basic qualifications to be a federal judge. I mean, people who don't know how to talk about, don't know the distinction between, um, you know, the different types of abstention and, you know, you know, people who won't actually take a position in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee on whether Brown versus Board of Education uh, was properly decided. I think ipso facto are unqualified to serve on any federal court um, whose responsibilities are charged with interpreting the Constitution of the United States, including the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. So. We like to end on a rousing note. So, Kelly, thank you. So, um, this brings us to the end of the program. Thank you to the online audience. Thank you for those of us, uh, for those of you uh, here in person today. One more time, the CLE code or the magic word is reform, R O F O R M. Do you need me to say something about those? Oh. Okay, and we also have evaluation forms if, you, if you'd like to uh, complete one of those as well. Thank you again, and look for us again next year. So thank you.